Okay, friends, I think we'll begin. I'd like to welcome all of you to this uh, roundtable seminar on, we've got a very convoluted and long-winded title in the program, but basically it's India in a globalized world is the essence of what we want to talk about. First of all, Mani Shankarayar sends his apologies. He very much wanted to be with us, but just through um, just a sheer coincidence, he's hosting Kursheed Kasuri <coughs> at this very moment as we speak. Uh, who is here as part of the track to diplomacy with Pakistan. So he sends his apologies and wishes us well in our discussions this afternoon. Uh, let me introduce the panel. We've got a very distinguished group of, of uh, thinkers and commentators. Ashutosh Varshni to my left, but not politically necessarily, but in terms of how we're seated. Nitin Pai at my right, I think that's apropos. And Paranjoy Gwata Kota to my immediate right, uh, Ashu, of course, as a uh, celebrity in his own right as a professor in the U.S. at now at Brown University, a commentator on India. Most recently, he's been writing in Foreign Affairs and Foreign uh, Policy <coughs> in the Times. And always interesting and has something provocative, uh, I'm sure to say. Uh, Paranjoy is a great friend, a senior journalist, a writer, and now a documentary filmmaker. Enjoy, I believe, as well. So, man of many parts, and we're glad to have you. And Nitin, another uh, friend and articulate, passionate uh, spokesman on Indian economic and security affairs, uh, and someone that you also will want to uh, listen to and, and uh, make note of what, what he has to say. Now, I had posed a few questions to our panelists to frame our discussion, but I'm going to invite them each to make a brief opening statement. Uh, framing our discussion of India in a globalized world. And we'll go in the order in which we're seated. So I'll first invite Ashu to make a few opening remarks. About five or six minutes, Ashu. Yes. Thank you, Rick. Pleasure to be at the IIC as always. actually my home in Delhi. Um, the first um, question that Vivek posed to us, which I'm sure will return for discussion, is whether India has emerged or is emerging. And the claim that India has emerged is squarely premised upon two statements that emerged from President Obama's trip to India. The first statement, <coughs> quote, the just and sustainable international order that America seeks includes a United Nations that is efficient effective, credible, and legitimate. That is why I can say today that in the years ahead I look forward to a reformed United Nations Security Council that includes India as a permanent member." Unquote. This is essentially the claim that legitimacy, effectiveness, and credibility of and the emerging international order in the 21st century requires India's inclusion. That's the claim for, um, um, that, um, uh, that's the intellectual judgment that underlies what President Obama said, watched by millions. And the second argument for why it has emerged is the following, in that the, the US and other Western powers now are increasingly dehyphenating India from Pakistan. <coughs> And the United States has actually invited India to participate in decision making about East Asia. For long, India was viewed as a regional player, and with this announcement, Mr. Obama gave credibility to the claim that he sees India as a potential partner in global problem solving. So these are the two grounds on which the claim that India has emerged can be made, and that's the claim that President Obama made. But I think it is uh, more analytically accurate uh, to say that India is emerging and still has quite a few miles to go before it can be called, uh, with, with the title emerged power <coughs> can be used. Now, um, consider just one, one or two comparisons, India and China, for example. <coughs> China's per capita income is three thousand dollars five was in two thousand nine three thousand dollars three thousand five hundred ninety dollars roughly thirty six hundred India's 
In 2009, 1,180. China, three times as large. Um, China has also developed military capability corresponding to its economic status. India, as all military and strategic analysts would tell you, lags behind. Um, now consider also that the other Asian tigers that emerge in the first Asian transformation that took place between 60 and 90. Um, the second Asian transformation includes now China and India. The first Asian transformation was South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, <coughs> and Singapore. South Korea's per capita income in 2009 was, was $19,830. Singapore's per capita income was $24,200. That's six times as large as China and in South, South Korea is six times as large as China and, uh, and uh, 12 times as large, uh, five times as large as China, 12 times as large, 12 to 13 times as large as India. Now, of course, size can make up for lower per capita income. We've known that in the study of international politics. When we think of national power, we don't mechanically correlate that with per capita income. That is why neither India nor China will have to acquire Singapore's per capita income, $24,000, in order to express or acquire international power. Um, uh, with the doubling of India's per capita income over the next seven to eight years, assuming a growth rate of 9%, 8.5 to 9%, India, that, that itself, a doubling of per capita income, given India's size, will generate a lot of international power for India. Mm -hmm. And other than size, of course, the great factor in favor of India is finally, at long last, its democracy. Um, regardless of how far ahead China goes economically, its power in the international system will be less than what it can potentially be so long as its citizens do not have political freedoms and cannot elect their rulers. Um, another analytical way of saying that is that compared to China, India will need a lower per capita income and a lower military capability to exercise as much power because it's blessed with democracy. We know that democracy um, is not an entirely virtuous political system. It has its many defects, but the mankind has not known a better system of governing its political affairs for all its faults. And um, there's something truly awkward about the citizenry not choosing its political rulers in the 21st century. Something is going to hobble China uh, in the coming years. And that's um, on India's side, the claim. <clears throat> Two more points about uh, India <coughs> in the international world and, and then some uh, conclusions or some concluding reflections. One, that if you look at um, the data that economic historians have produced, in 1750, China and India put together had roughly 57% of world's manufacturing output. Angus Madison has made this very famous, and Paul Bayrock, I think, both economic historians. Um, in 1900, and the West, what we call the West today in 1750, <coughs> had only 18.2% of the world manufacturing output. India had, India and China, India had 24.5, China had 32.8. By 1900, China had a mere 6% of the world's manufacturing output, India a mere 1.7%, and the West in 1900 had 77.4% of the world's manufacturing output. If you look at the, the upcoming projections, <clears throat> uh, any projection which predicts what will happen 40 years from now in the international economy should be taken with more than a pinch, with more than a pinch of salt. But assuming <coughs> that the assumptions <laughs> underlying these projections are right, by roughly, by roughly 2050, 300 years after 1750, these proportions are likely to be repeated. Assuming that the underlying, uh, uh, accepting the underlying assumptions behind these projections. So that we should keep in mind, there's something quite revolutionary, in other words, happening. And second, uh, India's trade over GDP has now crossed 50%. India's trade over GDP, that ratio was only 15% in 1991. Incidentally, China's trade over GDP before, um, 
uh, Deng Xiaoping started before modernizations was only 5%. So in other words, GDP. Essentially, China went out to the world to buy things that it could not produce at all, and basically to the, to the Eastern Bloc. Mm. Uh, India, uh, India's trade over GDP was higher than uh, historically, uh, right from 1950 to 1990, higher than it was for China. But uh, and India has now crossed 50 percent. That's more than three times the share, the 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 the, the, the percentage in 1991. But China, China's trade over GDP is 70 percent now. For an economy of China's size to ha have a trade over GDP ratio of 70 percent is actually unheard of. Large economies don't have very high trade over GDP ratios. Typically, that's true. But in China's case, trade over GDP is 70 percent. But coming back to India, uh, a 50% trade over GDP ratio means that trade is worth $550 billion today since India's GDP is over a trillion. At the growth rate, assuming a, a growth rate of 8 to 9% <coughs> per annum, India will be adding 100 to 120 to 130 billion dollars uh, each year to its GDP, of which 50 to 60 to 70 billion dollars would be, would be accounted for by trade international trade. That is something that India certainly hasn't seen perhaps in 1750 or 1760 or so, but this is a remarkable globalizing uh, trend that is emerging. Uh, if, and I'm not going into FDI and some other measures, to simply trade over GDP um, is beginning to look uh, very impressive now. And I, I must say when I was uh, living in India as a teenager and then studying uh, for my PhD at MIT, half, half, half of my work was in economics, half in political science. I don't think I had ever dreamed of a trade over GDP ratio for India that would be 50% to 40%. It was not possible to even envision a scenario like that. Um, I conclude with some uh, points. Uh, if if my, uh, my summary thus far has given the impression <coughs> that I have celebrated, I'm celebrating India's Growth record um, in an unqualified manner. I should correct uh, correct that impression with three qualifications about the coming years. First, authoritarian authoritarian policies may afford an unqualified preoccupation with economic growth, but a poor democracy that India is simply has to have inclusive growth. That is a democratic requirement. It just cannot be any other way. India's GDP today is 2.2% of the world GDP, but India has 7% of the world's billionaires. 2% of GDP, but 7% of the world's billionaires. India's new billionaires will either have to voluntarily share their wealth or democracy will push them, and I'll be happy to explain why I say so. This argument is based on some comparative work that I've been doing, a little piece up here in Financial Times two weeks ago <coughs> on this point. Second, um, so much depends on how India's billionaires behave, in other words. That's a variable worth looking for. The second variable worth looking out for is security relationship with Pakistan, often not discussed in purely economic analyses of, of India's rise. Um, more 2611s, more Mumbai's certainly won't stop India's growth, but they can slow India down significantly, and that argument is very well understood in circles that study security and economics together. <clears throat> Pakistan's stability, therefore, is in India's self-interest. And what India does to promote Pakistan's stability, not to promote Pakistan's instability, what India does will have some bearing. And, and it may be that Pakistan's stability is not in under India's control. It, that may be a perfectly valid argument. But Pakistan's stability is in India's economic interest. <clears throat> Third, Something about corruption has to be said now after what has happened over, over the last three, four months. And this is based on our FT article. Um, India has engaged in excessive self-flagellation over the last four months on corruption. Corruption has always accompanied rapid economic transformation all over the world under capitalist auspices, whether in, it was America's Gilded Age from 1865 to 1900, where there was Germany's industrial transformation under Bismarck, where it was South Korea during the 1970s and 80s, whether it was Japan during its industrial transformation. 
Corruption has always accompanied rapid economic advance. It is well understood in political economy circles and, and economic history circles. It is not an, a specific Indian disease. It's a generic property of rapid economic growth under capitalism. I'll be happy to explain this at, at length and give you historical examples. That, of course, does not mean that corruption should be celebrated. Corruption, of course, should be curbed. And it, it was curbed in all of these cases that I, that I gave you. And I've studied the, the, the late 19th century American history, economic history, very carefully, political and economic history, and can say something about that, how it was curbed in America. Uh, it has to be curbed in India also, primarily for the following reason that rampant corruption begins to delegitimate rapid economic advance. It has this property also. It begins to delegitimate rapid economic advance and it starts creating pressures against rapid economic advance. And so it needs to be cleaned up for that reason. And the key question there in my final comment, comment here is, is that we can't necessarily as as political realists, we can't necessarily rely on moral transformation of individuals to achieve better outcomes of corruption. The, the key question is what kind of regulatory institutions will have to be devised and with what powers. And that is how societies rapidly economically advanced, advancing in the past have checked corruption what regulatory instructions with what powers uh, is the key question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shu, for <coughs> framing the questions in, in a very precise uh, analytical way. And your three reflections at the end, I think we'll return to those as points of discussion and points of debate. Thanks very much. I'll turn next to, uh, to Paranjoy. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I do agree with much of what Professor Ashutosh Bhashne has already said. I have a few differences in perception, perhaps, in some of the points that he's raised. But by and large, what he said is a fairly uh, accurate and, my opinion, objective evaluation of the current state of affairs. The day before President Barack Obama visited India, the United Nations Development Program ranked India 116 among 162 countries in its annual ranking of countries under the Human Development Index. So even if some of us felt flattered that the President of the US has described that we are no longer emerging and we have emerged as a world superpower, the facts are a little stark. I mean, there are large parts of India where the state of health care, human nutrition is perhaps worse than that in sub-Saharan Africa. It's not I, but the United Nations Development Program, which has been saying this, not today, but for quite a few years now. It's also true that, yes, India's economy has been growing faster than before. There's no doubt about that. But what kind of growth have we really seen? How inclusive has been this growth? Has it narrowed income inequalities? Or has it widened them? Have the manner in which economic growth has been dispersed across geographical areas of this country? Or has it actually widened some of those imbalances? These are very, very important issues. To look at the big picture, yes, of course. The fact is that the United States of America with less than 5% of the world's population, 300 million out of 6.7 or 6.8 billion, yes, still accounts for close to a quarter of the world's GDP, roughly 15 trillion out of 60 trillion. It's also true that India and China for accounting for close to 40% of the world's population, are right now account for roughly a fifth of the world's GDP. 20 years ago, that was a tenth, maybe 20 years down the line, that will be closer to what Angus Madison had predicted and we'd be closer to that 40% mark. Uh, there's every reason to believe that would happen. But uh, the fact is that uh, it's become a bit of a cliche to keep pointing out to people that yes, one out of three computer software engineers on this planet is a person of Indian origin. 
But so is one out of three persons on this planet who's poor, who's hungry, who's illiterate, who's undernourished or malnourished. <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, I, I want to raise a question in connection to the point that Professor Ashutosh Bhashne made about roughly 50% of India's national income or GDP is today, you know, exports, imports, invisibles, remittances, everything put together. Whereas this proportion, I was told in the case of China, is higher than 70%. It's closer to three-fourths if you include invisibles, remittances, all that put together. Before the economic crisis, actually, it was reaching 80%. That's right. After the economic crisis, down to Okay, there you are. So uh, the question then would be that if China is, quote-unquote, more integrated with the rest of the world, then uh, how is it that in post-2008, world recession, etc., both these two countries were relatively insulated and were spared some of the worst ravages of the uh, worldwide financial, worldwide recession. And some, many would argue we're still going through it. We haven't yet come out of it, whether or not there's a double dip recession or not. Now, when one talks about the way in which India has grown, I don't want to get into this whole debate about what is the poverty line. But if one just goes along by what the latest estimates have been put out by the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, Professor Suresh Tendulkar, at least a third of India's population is below an internationally defined poverty line, which is 1.25 US dollars purchasing power parity. I mean, very, very conservatively. Roughly a third of the population <coughs> is what, surviving, more or less. The rest of the country, of course, is doing famously. George Bush woke up very late to the realization that the middle class in India equals the population of the US. But yes, the top third of the population, which includes the so-called middle classes, have definitely benefited. Now, when we talk about our notions of capitalism, socialism, mixed economy, mixed up economy, public, private, I think all these notions have undergone major changes, especially over the last few years. General Motors once epitomized free enterprise capitalism in the United States. More than 60% of General Motors is owned by the government of the US. So is it a private company? Is it a public company? You know, in India, you can argue what was public about our public sector if it was run like the personal fiefdoms of our netas and babus. And what was really private about our private sector if it growth was fueled by term loans and working capital from government-owned financial institutions. So our whole notions of capitalism, socialism, is China a communist country? Is it a state capital? country. I mean, these uh, notions have undergone major changes and therefore when Professor Vashnia talks about a certain inevitability of corruption growing with rapid economic advance under capitalism, the question that would arise, would India necessarily have to, would India's experience necessarily, necessarily replicate what has happened historically across the globe? It's a separate matter, he agrees. It should not. But let me make a few points in this connection. When you look at the way the world is changing, it is but inevitable that the economic power balance would shift eastwards. There's no doubt about that fact. It's not just the US, if the United States, or if, rather North America, Western Europe, and Japan account for 15% of the world's population and uh, consume, uh, well, 15% uh, of the world's population consuming about 75% of the world's resources, obviously that's not a sustainable way this planet can develop. If every citizen of, the, of India or China would be consuming like the average citizen of the US, then you need two planets Earth, which we don't have. You just have one planet Earth. Be that as it may, within India, when you look at India and the way in which India has the, the developed, quote-unquote, grown over the last 20 years, post-liberalization, you do see certain very, very prominent trends. I think there is a fair amount of documentary evidence which today indicates that inequalities have actually widened. The food inflation that we see as uh, something that's been particularly prominent in, the, over the, in recent months, but which has actually been a phenomenon over the last few years, have in fact sharpened inequalities. 
uh, there are many reasons why this has happened, and if anybody wants me to elaborate, I can definitely do so. There is uh, the other side of the so-called liberalization uh, pattern of industrial liberalization and economic liberalization that India has followed over the last 20 years. Let's take a classic example of the telecom sector, which is often showcased as a sector which has benefited the most from deregulation. I mean, we had one out of 10,000 citizens in this country. There was one phone for every 10,000 Indians in, when the country became ind independent. 50 years later, three years after deregulation, 1997, there was one phone for every 1,000 Indians. Today, there are seven phones for every 10 Indians. In the city where you live in, there are more phones than human beings, for instance. But, uh, you know, if you have just traveled 100 miles away on any direction, that tele-density will come to about 25 percent, one out of four. You see the ugly underbelly of the liberalization of India's telecom sector in the form of a scam called the Spectrum scam, often called the 2G Spectrum scam, a second generation Spectrum scam, which is essentially undervaluation of a resource. It's just thin air, it's electromagnetic frequencies which are used by mobile telecom companies, it's a scarce resource, it's a resource which is supposed to belong to the people of this country, it's been grossly undervalued, it's been misallocated, and whether or not you believe the controller and auditor general of India is another story, but the fact is, the country has lost a huge amount of money, it works out to, uh, according to one estimate, a thousand rupees for every human being, on, on, uh, every citizen of this country, one, seven, six, followed by three zeros, it's 76 followed by seven zeros crore. You know, so that's the figure that the CAG has come, which of course Mr. Kapil Sibal and Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia dispute. They say actually it's zero and it's not 176 followed by 10 zeros. But that's, uh, we, that's another story altogether. But the, the point is when we talk about corruption, and we talk about crony capitalism. Even Sonia Gandhi talks about crony capitalism these days, and uh, it's not just me. And uh, you know, the, the, the so-called nexus between business and politics, which again one could say is there the world over, but we do see the ugly underbelly of that nexus all around us. And when Professor Vashner talks about regulatory institutions, yes, we do see the failure of regulation. We do see why regulation has been ineffective, whether it be a body like the Controller and Auditor General of India, which is supposed to be the watchdog of the country's uh, public finances, or other bodies, whether it be the Securities and Exchange Board of India, or whether it be even institutions like the Lokayukta, the People's Ombudsman. A few days ago, we had a group of eminent citizens, including captains of industry who were all very, very upset at corruption and what they describe as a governance deficit. It's interesting that uh, the same set of people who arguably benefited the most from the policies of the government over the last 10 years are, are alarmed and expressing alarm over the growth of corruption in this country. Now, uh, on some of the points that uh, Vivek has raised, yes, of course, we sh see a shift in economic power balances in the world. Uh, yes, there are key challenges. The key challenges in this country, we know, I mean, there's today little dispute about the need to do much more to improve the working of India's social infrastructure, healthcare, education, and of course, the physical infrastructure, Bijli, Sarakpani, electricity, water, roads. Uh, there's no denying that. We can debate on how best this is to be done. But even as, one, even as there's a debate raging within this country about how do you really uh, enact a right to food act, where in certain s circles the, the word subsidy has only negative connotations, including food subsidies, there we run into huge problems. And this problem is, cuts across actually the ideological divide because within the Congress party there's a debate and within the political class as a whole there's a debate about what exactly do you understand by inclusive growth, job creating growth, growth which 
reduces inequalities, which reduces geographical imbalances instead of widening them. I do not uh, share Professor Ashutosh Vashner's optimism that the rich will voluntarily give up some of their wealth uh, and corporate social responsibility will change the face of Bharat. I very frankly doubt if uh, Mr. Mukesh Ambani, who with three other members of his family live in a 22-story department uh, in the heart of Mumbai, which is supposed to cost almost as much as a skyscraper, which is 10 times taller in Dubai, in one of the most expensive pieces of real estate in this country. A person who gifts his wife an aircraft worth a few hundred crores. Whether such individuals would, you know, sort of go by the whole Gandhian ethic of Bhutan and voluntarily give up their wealth to benefit the proverbial unwashed, illiterate masses. I think, uh, I don't really see it happening. I think the problems and the challenges that India faces are huge and immense. And I'll just mention one. We have a huge swath of territory in India. It starts from the Himalayas, goes all the way to the way of Bengal, as they say from Pashupati to Tirupati. Uh, it's not I, but uh, the Prime Minister of India says that there's an internal security threat. They call them Maoists, call them Naxalites, in roughly a third of this country's territory. It's not I, but the Minister for Union, Union Minister for Environment and Forests, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, says his biggest problem is that the most biodiverse parts of India are also the parts of India which has its richest mineral wealth. And this is also the part of India where the poorest of this country live in. Economists often describe this as a resource curse. I actually see that the way India has been developing over the last 20 years, some of these problems have actually worsened. They haven't improved, but actually the situation has worsened. And if we as a nation continue along the path, then we are probably going to see more of the kinds of problems which uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh describes as India's biggest internal security threat. And uh, I think there has to be a lot of rethinking about how do you actually bridge this governance deficit. Everybody knows there's a governance deficit, of course. But how do you, how do you actually bridge it? And uh, I mean, I have completely share Professor Vashner's view that, you know, the world over, there's no simple one-on-one -on -one or one-to-one -one correlation between democracy and authoritarianism in economic development. So in a sense, can India sort of grow in a way that's different? Can India economically grow without becoming also one of the most corrupt countries in the world? I mean, we've seen how Indian agriculture today is less than 18% of the country's GDP, but more than half the population is directly dependent on agriculture for their livelihood. So the world over, yes, agriculture as a share of GDP shrinks as a country develops, but so does the share of the population dependent on agriculture. According to the National Sample Survey Organization, 40% of those who farm don't want to farm, but they don't have a choice. They don't have any alternative employment opportunities. So uh, I see problems of inequality, horizontal, vertical, geographical imbalances, left-wing extremism as some of the biggest challenges. And here really we can then talk about what do you really mean by second generation economic reforms? What are you talking about reforming? Are you talking about reforming the public distribution system, the way in which food subsidies are provided? Are you talking about reforming the police system? Are you talking about reforming the judiciary? Are you talking about reforming the media, of which I'm a part? Or are you really talking about industry and services? So I think some of these challenges are huge. And Shall we perhaps return to those in right. the next Thank round? Thank you. Because that's, that's really a great entree into all right. our sure. next round. That's Thanks. really all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, Parun Joy. And you've added another layer of, of interesting questions and, and uh, points of, of discussion. So last but not least, Nitin, do you want to make your opening remarks? Yeah. <coughs> I'm going to stick to the six minutes given to me. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying that, you know, quoting Obama and our UN Security Council, 
seat, the non-permanent seat which we have <coughs> now. We are at a risk of confusing uh, India being an international bureaucrat with India being an international power, an emerging power. There is a difference. Participating in a UN Security Council in whatever form, or being a member of the G20, are just manifestations of an international presence that you have some stature in the world today. But the real test of whether India will be an, an emerging power, or a global power or not, is really whether it is able to use its power, muster up national resources, national power, to promote its interests, both at home, in the neighborhood, and across the world. Now the real test is this, how far are we able to influence <coughs> global politics? So I would leave you to judge that yourself because there is no right or wrong answer to India being an emerging power because emerging is a process, how long does it emerge, how much power do you, do you wield? But I would like to leave you with the thought that let's not get caught up with uh, appearances and, and form and let's focus on what really matters. How much is India contributing to the global balance of power today and in what trajectory is it going? There are three set of questions which follow. Do we as a country, forget about as a government, but as a nation, do we have a sufficiently sophisticated appreciation of global affairs today? We've spent the last 25 to 30 years playing defense. The world was out to get us and we had to defend. They said sign the NPT, we said no. They said sign the CTBT, we said no. Uh, they said sign this treaty, we said no. Uh, you know, we were, we were effectively playing, we were fighting, uh, you know, we were uh, you know, fighting against the internationalization of the Kashmir issue, defense again. So when it was defense, it was very easy, all you had to do is defense. But the world today is full of opportunities. And to make use of those opportunities, we need to have a sophisticated sense of how the world works, what the balance of power is, who the international actors are, what are their psychological profiles, how do their politics work, and that requires a huge intellectual machinery which sadly does not exist in this country. The second question is, do we have the capacity as a government to translate what little understanding we have of the world into policy? We have fewer, bureau, fewer foreign service officers than the country of Singapore. Singapore has more foreign service officers than the Republic of India. Uh, a joint secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs handles as many as 12 to 15 subjects. A joint secretary, his counterpart in the Foreign Ministry of Australia, has 17 people who handle each of those issues. So as an individual human being, what, what, what kind of capacity would this person have to promote India's interests abroad? So do we have, do we put thought into these very <coughs> mundane issues, quotidian issues of whether our, our, our government officials are in a position to make use of whatever resources we have over the last 15, 20 years and translate it into influence abroad. And third, do we have the kind of political and social machinery to translate the foreign to the domestic? I'll give you an example. China has spent about 30 years in a high growth path and because of which a large number of people have been employed, their skills have gone up, the productivity has gone up and because the productivity of labor has gone up, the wage, the real wages have gone up. They also have an issue of inflation because of some of the very same reasons we have, the, the structural issues when, when people earn more, they, their consumption pattern changes, people eat more meat, higher number of proteins, this is expensive and there are some structural reasons why inflation happens, they have that too. Third, the entire business, the entire competition, uh, competitiveness of China is built on, on being producing things in, at the cheapest cost in the world. Now if wages increase, the cost of produce which, which happen in China also increases. So China can't afford to really allow wages to increase as much as they should. Now China has caught in this spot <coughs> because if they were to play the old game of re devaluing the UN and uh, you know making the product exports artificially cheap, the US is not going to let them play this game anymore. So China has caught in this trap. They can't allow wages to go up. This is an external understanding of the world. Are we translating this into a, the natural internal understanding of domestic policy? What would you do if you are the government of India when China is in this situation? What would you do? You would liberalize labor laws, allow a large number of Indian uh, people who are, who are jobless or enjoying uh, the employment guarantee to come into manufacturing and produce and get real jobs and start off the manufacturing sector. You would 
play around with the, with the investment rules so that much of the hot money which is coming in as FII would translate into foreign direct investments in terms of industry, in terms of investments in capital goods, and convert that into real jobs and have a sustainable economy. <coughs> you are not doing that. We do not have the sufficient understanding of what's happening in the world. We do not have the capacity to translate it into policy, and we do not have the mechanisms to translate the foreign to the domestic. Now, it was okay when we were playing defense, but here is a world where there are so many opportunities to fix the, the, the poverty problem. I mean, there are various ways to talk about poverty, but it stands to reason that if there is a world out there which is giving us opportunities to solve a poverty problem, why in the world are we not taking, making use of those opportunities? So I think these are some of the more important questions which we have to be looking at, rather than uh, get into this entire ideological debate about uh, socialism, capitalism, and their various meanings and how they've changed over time. These are nice debates to have, but I think as a practical matter, I think we are at a, at a point in time, uniquely in our history, where there are a number of opportunities and we uh, have been, to, to use or to, mang uh, to mangle a phase, we have not lost an opportunity to lose an opportunity. Coming to a few other things which the other speakers have raised, I'm, uh, this, is, this is part of my uh, opening statement, just a couple of comments. I think the whole issue of Pakistan has been overblown. Uh, if you look at uh, when I agree in theory with uh, Ashutosh's point about Pakistan's stability being a constraint on our growth. But at what point in time? Will we enjoy three more percentage points in growth if we liberalize labor laws? Will we enjoy another percentage point of growth for the next five years if we improve our FDI uh, regime? Will we improve our sustainable growth if we spend more money and liberalizing the education sector and getting more people educated in skills and higher education? And at what point? would those generals sitting in Pakistan begin to matter? Not in the next 10 to 20 years. So the, the whole issue of Pakistan has been overblown. In fact, the whole, I would argue that the whole Pakistan problem is over. What we problems exist are the problems we have with the states that scaffold Pakistan. Uh, United States, China and Saudi Arabia who don't let the Pakistani political transformation take place to, and take place to its eventual, uh, uh, eventual conclusion and then let us manage the consequences whatever they are. And the last point, very quickly, is you know food inflation, which Paranjoy raised, 2G scam, or even the, the, the case of uh, farmers committing suicide. These are not because of reforms. These are not because of capitalism. These are because of the lack of reforms. You have farmers who are trapped to be farmers. You can't, you can't be not be a farmer. Your son has to be a farmer. And the government of India says, you, Mr. Farmer, stay there. You can't sell your land to somebody who's not a farmer, so you are destined to be a farmer. But if you have problems, we'll give you more money to, say, to stay a farmer. This is what has been happening. There is no freedom for a farmer to change from being a farmer to a worker in a factory or a, or a school teacher or something like that. 2G scam, you've entirely changed the whole idea of a free market capitalist uh, structure where you have a, a well-known system of auctions which was practiced in the past into something called first come first serve that whoever knows the decision being made in the ministry tomorrow morning ends up at the headquarters of the ministry at 8.30 a.m., picks up the form and becomes a, uh, a, a telecom operator. This is not capitalism. This is plain scam. This is just, just plain crime. You know, it's criminal. And then the last thing about Vidarbha is we've spent 50 years trying to keep these guys as farmers. And then uh, you say that, oh, if you, uh, you know, we'll waive your loan, uh, you know, because uh, you're committing suicide, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll waive your loans. And what does that, what incentive does it create? You're creating a, a trapped constituency of farmers who have no other way to, to come out of their trap other than take a loan either from a government or from a money lender and expect that to be waived. And when that doesn't waive, when that doesn't get waived, you do what is what has been happening over time, which is you commit suicide. So we, we, we shouldn't blame uh, capitalism or free market reform for many of these problems. These problems are manifestations of a lack of reform. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Nitin. You've also raised a, a whole host of interesting questions and uh, perspectives. Now, I, I am conscious that we do want to save time for a Q&A, and that's the purpose of a roundtable and a debate. So I, I would like to, um, as it were, till with a light or as a moderator, and without uh, going through a series of rounds, perhaps invite each of our panelists again to reflect on what their colleagues have said, if they want to amplify on what you've said in the first round. And I've got a whole 
a range of questions myself, but let me just see if we want to get a quick reaction from our panelists to what has been said uh, by their fellow panelists. Ashu, do you want to amplify or comment a bit on what's been said? Um, Polancho has, uh, the point uh, uh, that Paranjay made about inequalities is the point I wish to address. There's lots of points he made. Um, and um, my own view is that that um, some economic, some degree of economic inequalities is actually quite healthy for um, economic growth, for innovation, for um, for people, uh, for the the um, talented um, receiving their rewards. Um, I would not be I would not bemoan the rise of IT billionaires, for example, information technology billionaires. I might bemoan the rise of uh, um, mining billionaires, but not IT billionaires. But, um, but this point about inequalities emerging as a, in a, in a market-based system as a reward for, as a consequence of talents getting rewarded different ways, skills getting rewarded this way, this has to be qualified. That is, when it becomes excessive, whatever its impact on the economy, it begins to corrupt the political process badly. So I, my, my argument for why inequalities are unhealthy is a, it's an argument about the degree of inequality and the second that um, I'm less concerned about what, what, what it might do to economy in an uh, economy per se. I'm more concerned about what 7% what, um, what, uh, of world's billionaires in an economy which is only 2% of world's GDP, what they can do to the political process. So um, the scam for me the 2G scam for me, uh, I, I don't think um, uh, Nitin's point is, is entirely wrong. I, I think it's partial. Uh, um, it, by, by creating a very free market capitalism in a society as poor as India, right, you will in undoubtedly get a very uh, mounting inequalities. And after a threshold, those inequalities will be politically dangerous, extremely dangerous. So, so I'm, I think he's partly right, but I don't think Nitin is fully right about this. Right? But inequality should not be seen viewed as a binary, either inequalities or no inequality or inequality. I think it should be seen on a sliding scale. I just want to, can I just uh, take up a quick point, Ashu, yeah. before we move on? Because all of you talked about inequality in different ways. So if we can just frame the question analytically, I mean, we can all debate about philosophically what, is our, what do we believe um, is more important, inequality or poverty? But you've made the very interesting argument that politically, a high level of inequality will foster corruption and will foster political uh, disorder or could threaten the polity. Do you want to perhaps amplify just a little bit on that point? As as political scientist, what 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 does theory, history, evidence tell us about this uh, elsewhere where we've seen rapid growth? Okay, so um, America's Gilded Age, the term that Mark Twain coined and made. Um, made so famous is basically the period 1865 to 1900. And um, gilding is, as you know, adding more and more gold, basically. That's what, yeah. So, Gilded Age is uh, 1865 to 1900. America was uh, primarily a great in society in 1865 after the end of the Civil War. Not more than 30% of America's population lived in cities. It was a country of independent farmers up in the north and and the slavish agriculture or, or, or slave driven agriculture in the south. <clears throat> By 1865, slavery was of course over. So that's the history, uh, prior history. Um, and by, within three decades, in uh, America became uh, an industrial giant, a primarily urban society. By 1902, America's per capita income was higher than UK's per capita income. We seem to think that America's rise to prominence dates back only to the Second World War, but in economic terms that it happened by the first five or first seven years of the 20th century. Um, this whole um, 
this rise of an industrial and economic giant was accompanied by enormous corruption at each level of government. Um, half of uh, the pres half of Ulysses Grant's presiden uh, presidential administration by 1876, Ulysses Grant was a Civil War hero, twice elected president of the United States, left office in shame and embarrassment. By 1875, half of the cabinet was indicted for financial wrongdoing. At the state level, the story was no different. Uh, Jay Gould, the railroad baron, uh, writes openly that he bought four state legislatures because he had to put his railroads his rail tracks through those four states. Right? At the local level, Tammany Hall stories of New York City are, are, are staple of, 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 of American politics, uh, study of American politics in the late 19th century. George Washington Plunkett, a boss, machines rose, urban machines rose, bosses rose. Uh, George Washington Plunkett uh, was the boss of Tammany Hall in the late 19th century. He writes openly about open graft, an honest graft and dishonest graft. Honest graft is the way, this is his, his conception of honest graft. I'm in the government, I come to know which, in which part of Manhattan uh, a park will be built or a bridge will be built. I go buy land there and when the park is announced, I'll sell it back at twice or three times the price that I bought it, which would be called corrupt, completely unacceptable corruption today. He called it, you know, honest graft. That's how he made his millions. Dishonest graft is when the treasury loses revenue, he says. This is not the way Treasury loses revenue. This is just the way politicians make money. Right? Um, and he was also opposed to professional civil service. Civil service essentially meant a spoil system. I come in power and I make my appointments uh, of all bureaucrats and get rid of the previous guys. Professional civil service was born in America only in 1883 after a lot of pressure. Now, so. Um, you know, it's not, I think Prapananjo is not wrong to say that India does not have to repeat all this. I, I don't think, I think that's a very, that's an intellectually valid proposition. But to say that India will depart from all that the world has experienced radically is to sort of, you know, fall into this uh, logic that India is somehow unique and we can do, we can escape the, what is called rapid industrial advance under capitalism. Is it, I, I think we can check its a degree or something like that, but the idea that rapid economic advance under capitalism, you know, I, I think the debate whether it's capitalism or what is public private, I agree with Nitin is not so important actually. What we are saying is that market system is not driving India. It's not as it's not certainly as free market as America was uh, between 1865 and 1900. But please note that modern American state, with its laws about checking corruption, laws about checking monopolies with an income tax in 1913, FBI in 1912, anti-monopolies in 1908. This was all born in the last hundred years after the Gilded Age. And the driving force was middle class disenchantment, middle class um, uh, 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 revulsion against the current practices of businesses and politicians. But if That's I, what drove the, drove the transformation. Actually, if I can just interrupt you. Uh, we don't want to, of course, fall into the trap, uh, and Parvind has reminded us of this, we don't have to repeat the U.S. experience, yeah. but based on your, your telling of the story, there's some remarkable parallels with yes. what happened in America's Gilded Age and what's happening now in India. So what would you as a political scientist take away as, if you wanted to draw a lesson that could, be, could have policy relevance for us today in India? Well, I, I, want, I hope that uh, middle class revulsion in India will not take 30 years. It took at least 20 years in America before the system changed. I hope it won't take 20 years. I hope it takes place. It happens sooner. And I don't see how politicians, which, even if, if let's say, politicians will change their conduct radically or fundamentally unless they feel voter pressure. I don't think that there are some visionary politicians uh, always in inequality, in including in India today. But that's not how polity is run by just visionary politics. The system is run by politicians as a mass. And I don't see how that will happen without a voter, voter disillusionment, voter revulsion against the, the current practices of politicians. But please also note, the press does not write about the current practices of businesses. Politicians resign, ministers resign, press writes about who made how much money through selling of this uh, spectrum or selling of that uh, uh, you know, electromagnetic waves. There is virtually no reporting in India of what, what is called business corruption. Very little except Reddy Brothers in Karnataka or something. We have, for example, we don't know how exactly mining licenses are bought and sold in any systematic way. There's enough, you know, a story here, a story there. But current practices of business are not something that Indian media has reported as much on 
as, for example, 1880s uh, press in America. People made careers reporting on the practices of David Rockefeller and Standard Oil. Yeah. Right? Ashu, uh, if yeah. I just can bring in our two other panelists, do you, uh, would, would either of you want to weigh in on this, this interesting debate that is corruption a corollary of rapid economic development? Do we have to accept at some level corruption, inequality, uh, as a byproduct of, of rapid growth, or is there a different trajectory that we should be taking, we could be taking? I'll enjoy it. Okay. Do you uh, want to yeah. use this? All right. Uh, sorry. No, I, I do indeed have a lot of problems in accepting a proposition and a certain degree of inequality, economic inequality, <coughs> is the way you can actually reward the talented and good and healthy for the country. You know, I mean, a uh, lot has been talked about the Reddy Brothers and Karnataka. I just happen to have made a documentary film series on the subject and Ram Guha describes the two faces of capitalism and globalization in Karnataka. Narayan Murthy as Infosys, philanthropy, building hospitals, building schools, and the Reddy Brothers, the complete convergence of crime, business, and politics in the same state. The same guys who are ministers, they're also the business people. They're also uh, arguably the part of the mafia. Um, I do have problems in accepting the proposition that there's something you know new about what is happening today. Uh, inequality in India is as old as India. Okay. Uh, Corruption of the, of the political process, the nexus between business and politics and funding of election campaigns didn't start today. It started with the first general elections. Mm -hmm. Not the first general or, or perhaps if not the first, perhaps the second or I the third. I think mid-1960s okay. is the... I think that is well studied. Mid-1960s right. is, sure. is the beginning of... Uh, okay. Of I, I accept uh, it. But I said even Mondas Karamchand Gandhi did accept political donations from the Birlas and the Lalbai. So I, I'm that saying... That was all legal. That was open. That was open. That's not corruption. All right. So, so let me say that the glaring loopholes in the law, okay, if you say it's really a process that started in the 60s, I'll accept it. That process got exacerbated, undoubtedly, that there are even today huge loopholes in the Representation of the People Act, and it's hardly a secret that if illegal funding, I mean, if politicians are funded illegally for the election campaign, that quid pro quo will operate when that same politician becomes a member of parliament or a minister. Okay, this whole issue of voter pressure, let me make a point here. Anti-incumbency sentiments in India have been about as strong as they have been anywhere in the world. 40% of the members of parliament in the last three Lok Sabhas were not re-elected. 50% of the members of legislative assemblies in the last 10 years were not re-elected. The question then would arise, how are we looking at this phenomenon? Is it that once a politician gets elected, he or she becomes venal and corrupt because uh, politics is such a risk risky business, he or she knows that there's a 50% or a 60% chance I'm not going to be sitting in that seat five years down the line, so let me make as much money as quickly as I can. Or does it make that same representative of the people more responsive and say that, look, if I try and do something, then there is that 50% chance or that 60% or that 40% chance that I would be voted back to power. The jury is out on that one. I would prefer to be somewhat optimistic and believe that, yes, Voter pressure is being felt. We've had 15 general elections in this country. In about seven of them, there have been fairly peaceful changes of regime. Okay. My problem is that, you know, from the time Jawaharlal Nehru, you know, talked about the mixed economy, we seem to have replicated the worst practices across the globe. In the name of capitalism, we had a license control Raj. In the name of socialism, we had a third-rate healthcare and education system. Not only have we replicated worst practices from across the globe, we fail to replicate best practices from within the country. If India had healthcare indicators which were comparable to Kerala, then India's healthcare indicators would be superior not only to that of China, but also comparable to that of the United States of America. So th the question is, this whole issue about, is India unique? Just because we have 17 languages in our currency? No, just because we say there are 22, 23 languages that, that can be used for official purposes? Yes, okay, we are unique. At the same time, maybe 
is there that inevitability that our growth will have to be accompanied by more corruption, more inequality. I find it difficult to accept that proposition. And just as Professor Vashnia talked about the honest graft and dishonest graft, that's about as old as India is. You know, we, we are very, very good at distinguishing between the more corrupt and the less corrupt, between the corrupt and efficient and the corrupt and inefficient. Tarun Das, former secretary, uh, director general of the Confederation of Indian Industry, in an unguarded moment, now he eats his words, he described Mr. Kamal Nath, former highways minister, now minister for urban, urban, development. urban, urban development. development, and Mr. 7, 15%. Good guy. I'm just making one point, and that if we have so far replicated some of the worst practices across the globe, we need not continue this way. I'm reasonably optimistic that we won't. I'm reasonably optimistic that perhaps some of these worst aspects of economic growth, accompanying with growing inequality, growing corruption, we might be, hopefully, be able to do some of that. You talked about free enterprise market, market in the absence of regulation. I mean, who emasculated the TRAI to enable Mr. Raja to cherry pick his recommendations and to sell spectrum the way cinema tickets are being sold? Or why did we have to wait for a Harshad Mehta scandal before we chose to empower the Securities and Exchange Board of India? I mean, why is why this kind of reaction that we start sort of cleaning, getting our act together after a fair amount of damage is done? In that sense, I'm saying that uh, I'm hopeful that we won't continue to sort of becoming more intelligent only by hindsight. That's all. Thanks. You want to weigh in on yeah. this? Yes, a couple yeah. of <coughs> I'll, I'll just talk about uh, I mean, something very, very unsexy compared to what uh, Vipu spoke. You know, in any, any sector of the economy, there's always a, a, a gap between the industry and the guys who are regulating that industry. Uh, whether it's the United States or whether it's uh, Japan or whether it's India, this, this is always true. The question is how big that gap is. And does the system, does the, the system of government allow that gap to be closed? or you know, dynamically adjust that gap as long as, as small as possible. India's system just doesn't. There is, as, I mean, compared to 20 years ago, each sector of the economy is so complex to regulate, whether it's insurance, whether it's spectrum, whether it's, tele I mean, 20 years ago, there was no mobile, uh, there was no spectrum to allocate, you know. I mean, 20, 25 years, there was no spectrum to be given. There was all, it's all fixed line. So it was quite fairly easy to get people to regulate telecoms. But today, it's, it's 3G. There is an intersection of, uh, telecommunications and IT, whether it's a phone, whether it's a computer, you just don't know. This is just telecoms, insurance, everything gets more complex. Now, when we are in a situation where the industries that are being, that the, the modern economy, Indian economy is, uh, is hosting are so complex, how do we imagine these people with, with generalist degrees with no refresh of education or skills to regulate these things? So, of course, it won't solve the, the Raja kind of scandals, which are just criminal acts. Which are, there is no substitute, no system can survive bad people, right, and bad government. So in this case, I mean, Raja and others apart, but quotidian acts of corruption can actually be checked by good policy, for which you need good policy makers, and the Indian system of getting people and good people into government simply doesn't exist. One, one sentence. One, I, I just wanted to react to what Professor Ashutosh Bhashne said about why the media does not report about corruption in business. Day. Because 90% uh, of the revenues of media companies come from advertisers, big, big advertisers. Today, we have at least newspaper reports which talk about how Mr. Tata in the past, Mr. the group of companies headed by him, in the past were actually saying we'll withdraw advertising from particular newspapers or media groups because they haven't written nice things or the way they've written is not good. Now he's saying we won't even give you a quote. You are blacklisted. It's not I, but Mint newspaper, which is headed by... Mrs. Shobhna Bhartia, daughter of the late K.K. Birla, who has talked about, uh, <coughs> written about this. I mean, two things are happening in the media. I mean, we do see growing corruption in the media, but we also see at least a section of the media remaining proactive. And I, there is some amount of reporting on the margins, on the fringes, on the fringes about corruption, uh, business corruption. Maybe not as much as what happened in, in the United States in, in the uh, last uh, century. 
Thanks, Paranjoy. I'm just looking at the clock, and we do want to make this session uh, interactive. We've only got about 15 minutes left, so I would like to open this up to a Q&A. Uh, just one request, uh, if you could please speak into a microphone, because this session is being video recorded, uh, and please uh, tell us your name. And if you could make your question very brief, we would really uh, appreciate that. And please uh, indicate to whom, which member of the panel is your question addressed. We'll open it up. And please find a microphone and make your question. So just come up to a microphone if you don't have one so we get your question recorded properly. Um, my name is Harsh Gupta. Uh, my question is uh, to anybody on the panel who wants to answer it. Why are we not talking about uh, the lack of uh, privatization and property rights in mining? or natural resources more generally, which was the base of the corruption, it seems, in Gilded, uh, the US uh, railways, as you said, and now in Karnataka. So it seems there it's a lack of uh, proper market structure rather than corruption per se. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to take this on? Shall we collect a few? How about we collect a few more questions and we we'll let the panel react to it. Sir, on the end of the table, you had your hand raised. My name is G.P. Bukai. On the corruption issue, I think the qualitative difference between what happened to a growing economy like the U.S. and the case of India is that the numbers involved who suffered due to corruption are much larger, and therefore the gap over here is going to be very much more difficult to uh, overcome because of the huge amount of inequality, and illiteracy, the powerlessness of the poor, the disruption is far more, which is why we have luxury lights, mouths, and so on. And the only way to get over this, I mean, why this may get over faster is because of the technology that's coming in, which is going to be able to track, uh, you know, track corruption and such things, so that so that corrective uh, measures can be taken. Okay, I think we'll take that as a as a comment to which you want a reaction. So you've had your hand up, and you've got. How about we take one or two more in this round, and we'll do another round. Uh, my name is Kartar Kapoor, sir. Uh, my submission is uh, that about corruption again. Uh, I think corruption is the oldest profession as any other profession on the earth. As but, but, but what is your question, sir, my, to, the panel, to the panel? My, you want to be very precise. All, all Just right. because we're very short of time, so right. we can make your question very precise. The question has been there ever since, and we can't get away with it. It depends what level we want it, at what level, at time, given time and place, what should be its level. I give you just, if you allow me, I give you just one example, just one example. It is as old as the oldest profession, number one. Number two, now that the, the, the debate is going on, there are foreign accounts in the foreign countries. People are having a lot of money, they should come back. If it does come back, what will be the uh, I mean, repercussions? on the uh, people, those who are dealing with that economy. Okay, and thank you. We'll take that as, a, again, a comment that the panel may wish to react to. The, the young lady here has had her hand up for some time. Good evening, this is Ayush. My question is to Professor Vashni. Um, I agree with you, sir, that the problem with in, uh, you cannot talk of inequalities as binary, but uh, you should talk of them as degrees. But I would like to ask you, that could you suggest some specific solutions which would address the problem of Indian inequalities being acutely descriptive in nature, because that is our social and historical reality, and I do not think that we can discard that. Thank you. So I think at this point we should let the let the panel react to the the first set of questions. Ashu, do you want to? We'll just go around the panel again as before. Um, so the question that is, is specifically addressed to me. Um, which takes the following form, that inequalities in India uh, are acutely ascriptive, birth-based. Um, so it's not like inequalities in Western nations where um, if you were a Dalit, you one could predict, uh, in India, if you were a Dalit, one could predict that you would be 90% chance you'd be very poor for the rest of your life and your children also will be. You know, that's the kind of question that is being asked. That's, that's a, um, now, um, it is, I think it's fair to say that 
inequalities in India have much greater ascription in them, birth-basedness, than in many of the societies, Western societies. It's not that it's you know being black in in American society historically was not correlated with being poor and badly treated. So that was true there as well. But but I think you're right to say that uh, the kinds of birth-based um, uh, distinctions that the caste system, and that's what the question is aimed at, the caste system, and tribes to some extent, the caste system perfected and developed, very, in these, dig, in these gradations all the way from the bottom to the, to the top, it is something very, that's very, very specific, very unique, it's, that I think is true. Um, the solution, I think the um, uh, affirmative action has to be supported for dealing with caste-based uh, inequalities. A market is not the, a very quick solution, or for that matter, in a market, if you develop some skills, then you get rewards from markets. If you don't have skills, don't have education, the market is not going to reward you. Right? The market is not uh, very good at, at uh, dealing with those who either don't have capital or skills. All right? Uh, therefore, uh, all over the world, the idea of affirm affirmative action has gained ground over the last five, six decades. The question is what kind of affirmative action, how long, you know, and how to implement it. But, uh, but Indian reservation policy, for all its faults, followed this thinking all over the world that affirmative action was the only way to go, only way to handle this problem. Uh, now, supported by markets, but not by markets alone. For example, a very interesting story about Dalit capitalists of some days ago. I don't know whether you tracked it down. Chandavan Prasad, a rather interesting Dalit intellectual, put together a group of Dalit capitalists and took, took them to Monte Singhalawalia. And uh, Monte Galawalia interacted with these uh, Dalit capitalists, asked them, you know, what the issue, what the issues were about development of business, etc. That's a long-run story. That will also take very long. And and public policy, certainly in a democratic society, has to respond in in the form of affirmative action. Yep. Uh, I, I agree entirely with what uh, Professor Ashutosh Vashnia said, and this is really about India's uniqueness all over again. Yes, even though we agree that caste and class tend to overlap in most parts of the country, what makes India truly unique is we have rich Dalits and poor Brahmins. You might find them difficult to find in your locality, but there are Brahmins who clean your toilet. You may not find it that difficult to find a Dalit who lives life five-star style. And I don't just in, uh, include in that category the current chief minister of Uttar Pradesh. Be that as it may, I mean, this really makes the whole situation in India that much more complex and that much more unique. The question that was raised about this whole issue of mining, I'll react to that. I think the privatization of mineral resources without putting in place adequate regulatory systems is really the problem. You have here a technical regulator called the Indian Bureau of Mines based in Nagpur which is for all practical purposes toothless. When I made this documentary film on the Bellari Iron Ore Mines, we have the Mines Minister now, the former Mines Minister, saying 90% of the mines there are illegal according to the IBM. But the government of India really had no power to ensure that the government of Karnataka acted. So it's not really a question of changing the existing Mines Act to include local populations so that they become stakeholders in projects. What we have today is that so-called governance deficit where even the existing laws of the land are not properly implemented, which is what you are seeing in Bellari and Anantapur, an area I'm somewhat familiar with on this issue. So uh, it's not lack of privatization. It's, it's privatization without regulation. That is the problem. And I do agree with the gentleman uh, who was there, Mr. Bagai. Yes, corruption affects large numbers of people in India because it's, it, it's, it's an economic issue, it's a social issue and, and it, it really has a huge impact on a very, very large section of people. And, and that's the point I made in my initial presentation that today those eminent citizens which include corporate captains, even they are expressing their alarm and what they see as the growing governance deficit, the absence of accountability, the abuse of discretionary power, the kind of rent-seeking that we've seen. No? Yes. Yeah, uh, as someone who spent 
quite a few few years of my life employing technology in policy. I must uh, sort of inject a note of pessimism here. Technology is like a toothbrush. The brushing is what keeps your teeth clean, not the tooth toothbrush itself. So uh, I don't think technology is going to uh, anyway uh, be a magic bullet which solves it. But the regulatory structures and the way, the, and, and in, in, in the end, it's the people who are sitting on top of these institutions who make that difference. So there is no substitute for that. Thank you, Nitin. We've got, I think, just enough time for two or three more quick questions. Yes, so if yeah, you could no, get, a, get a microphone and just ma make it very brief, sir. Uh, excuse me, sir. Thank you for your excellent uh, um, presentations to the panelists. But today's uh, uh, subject is uh, round table on globalization and development, the rise of the BRICS. India's economic relations and the future of globalization. Why uh, Russia and uh, Brazil left out? Actually, that's a no. That's a very good question. We had a rather, I think, overly ambitious, uh, overly ambitious set of questions. Uh, and you're right. We didn't get to touch on the other BRICS and a, and a number of questions I had. So maybe we can get the panelists to quickly react. We will collect two. I think we've got time for two more questions. So the, so the first one is, what about the other BRICS? I will comment. One comment. Just, no, I think no more comments, just questions. I so there's a quick, yes. Quick. Well, uh, I thought that it was extremely interesting, uh, uh, the entire discussion, but I did not quite see what were the arguments behind certain statements that were made. For example, when uh, he points out, you know, when thinking about the relationship between rapid economic growth and corruption, his uh, pessimism that uh, concerning India, that it is bound to, uh, you know, we are bound to see something like that. Uh, what is the argument behind that? Is it only because the history repeats itself? Okay, I think, that I think, the circumstances I think we've got your question. Whereas he we've said, got a, Madam, we've got to move on. We're running out of time. We've got your question. So is history, are we doomed to yeah, repeat but, history? But what about the opposite? That when he is optimistic, is, it is we'll due to them, what? What are the arguments for that either? These are two statements, but no arguments to back it up. We'll let them weigh in. And we've got time. Sir, towards the back, you had your hand raised. Yeah. Okay. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Just get a microphone, please. So that's all. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh. Um, very last. Yes, we hear that there is an explosive growth in GDP. Uh, India, China, uh, 8%, 10%, and so on. <clears throat> Have you made any, any what you call uh, uh, analysis of what part of this GD GDP is foreign owned? I mean, what part is Indian owned and what part is foreign owned? Have we made any calculations on that at all? Okay, I think, we, I think we've got your question, sir. And over here, last question before we let the panelists sir, react. Do the Indians are somewhat poor in comparison to some of the freer countries because are we more demanding, the society is demanding more of entitlements than rights? Is that, a, is that one of the reasons why we are poor? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I think the one question that did resonate with me because it was, um, advertised is the BRICS. So given that time is short, could we get the panelists to comment briefly on where does India fit into this picture and does the rise of the BRICS represent a putative or an incipient shift in the global political economy away from its traditional sort of transatlantic uh, roots? Are we seeing a shift in the global polity? If we can conclude with a broad reflection on that and I'm going to again I should ask you to, to start us off on this. And if you could combine concluding remarks with that, that would be great. Um, yes, I think um, we should have um, responded at least to some extent to what we advertise. So um, that's it's a, it's a very fair criticism. Um, I have spoken quite a bit about China, I have lots of data, but the basic point that is beginning to emerge. Um, on the BRICS comparison is that Chinese capitalism, all four are, are going through capitalism now uh, of various kinds, but Chinese capitalism 
is state dominated, state driven. The biggest corporations of China are still state owned. Nobody is worth more than $5 billion. Before, before, if you cross $5 billion, you are, to put it simply, cut off by, by the state. Your, 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 your legs, your economic legs are cut off, so, you know, as it were. Um, uh, Russia is developing what is now come to be called oligarchic capitalism. If, if 7% of billionaires of the world are in an economy which is producing 2.2% of the output, that's India, that ratio looks much worse for Russia, incidentally. So you shouldn't be surprised that Russian billionaires are buying New Jersey Jets, maybe New York Knicks soon, and, you know, and not only the football clubs. Uh, in the basketball clubs, and they are just, uh, or Maria Sharapova is growing up basically in Florida, you know, etc. Uh, you know, so this is all um, connected to, 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 to the to the oligarchic capitalism of Russia. The, uh, if you, I mean, the extent to which I've talked to business observer, observers about this, as well as my own understanding of how innovation develops, the innovation in the next uh, decade or two, most of the innovation among, from, uh, from this category called the BRICS will emerge from India and Brazil. Why? Because the, what is wrong with encouraging billionaires and, and capitalists is that there can be a lot of corruption, a lot of inequalities, but what is right about that is that the innovator starts getting a, uh, serious rewards, not simply those who are corrupt. So IT, IT is definitely one of the most innovative, innovative things that has happened in India. And it's revolutionizing the way we do business all over the world. That is beginning to happen in biotech. That is, people are talking about how pharmaceuticals might go in that direction. I don't, I'm not, don't know enough about that. I know something about biotech. But IT is definitely demonstrated that Indian businessmen are capable of innovation and of revolutionizing world industry. IT is not based on low wages which is the Chinese, the Chinese uh, comparative advantage. China is not producing a lot of innovation yet. Right? And Brazil, Brazilian corporations also, you know, this is the other side of inequality. I don't know whether Paranjay, I think, won't agree with this. You know, the, Brazil is, of course, more unequal than India. Brazilian, Brazilian Gini is 0.65. Indian Gini is 0.45. Let me, once again, let me add once again. That. So, so the corporations that are emerging in Brazil, for example, in, in energy, clean energy, the corporations that are emerging in Brazil on clean energy, are some of the most innovative. And they're beginning to transform the way people think about clean energy all over the world. Right? So, so that's the basic BRICS. There are lot, lots can be said about BRICS. And a lot of us are thinking about that, reading about that, uh, researching. But the, the m most interesting point that is beginning to emerge with a lot of consensus right, is that Indian innovation is likely to be much stronger than Chinese innovation. And Indian and Brazilian innovation is likely to be much stronger than Chinese and Russian innovation. So it's not that oligarchic capitalism will produce, in, uh, will produce innovation either. There is a sense in which there is no IT in Russia, despite all the riches. But there is an IT equivalent in Brazil emerging, that is clean energy corporations. There's a lot that can be said, we don't have time. But I thought that was the basic point. There's one more thing that uh, the lady, I think, was right to say that you made statements, didn't show the logic. You know, we don't, it's just hard to do both, make both the analytic statements and show the logic in seven minutes. So, yeah, but the basic point, ma'am, is this. Um, the American growth rate, there's some dispute during the Gilded Age was about 7%, which was roughly the highest possible at that technological time, right? 9% growth rate maintained over three decades or so is basically a late 20th century phenomenon. Japan saw it, Korea saw it, China saw it, now India is seeing it, right? And 9% growth rate begins to create the kinds of opportunities, both for the regulator and the businessman. And the, the scale of rewards could be so high that if you don't have moral scruples, and a lot of people would be a little weak on the moral side in the world, you slip or you want to just make a killing, to put it bluntly, to make a killing. A lot of people would like to make a killing if given opportunities. 9% creates those opportunities. It's true of China, it's true of India. Indian corruption is better known because media is free. For all its, for all its problems, for all the problems that he's listed, in media is free, it's reporting. The tapes are leaked. If you leak tapes in China, anyone who leaked tapes in China would have been executed by now. 
China executes Pranab Bharadhan has produced statistics. China executes more people per year than the total number of executions in India since independence. Right? So there is a there is a sense in which India the, the corruption story of India in, in, in India is a victim of its own success, if you will, right? The media is actually quite free for all its problems. And it's reporting, you know, on, on this and the world over. We read about it. Thanks, Ashu. Paranjoy, I, I'll make a, yeah, I'll, I'll just make a few brief observations. The gentleman is correct in feeling disappointed because we hardly talked about Brazil, Russia, China, not to mention South Africa. Uh, excuse me, sir. My name is Natrashiko. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We didn't even mention Turkey, Korea, Mexico, Indonesia, East Africa, East Europe. We were supposed to talk of the world. Not that I'm an expert on any of these subjects. Uh, look, this phrase or, or this acronym, BRIC, was coined by an economist from Goldman Sachs. It's almost been a decade. I can say that the importance of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and I include, I make it BRICS to add South Africa to it, has certainly increased many fold since this acronym was coined in the uh, almost, I, I think about nine years ago or thereabouts. Uh, because few could have imagined the way in which the recession would, uh, the, the impact of the recession in, in America and, and which spread and had an impact in the rest of the world. Having said that, I think there's a lot that in India, we need to learn from not only clean energy from uh, in Brazil, but I think the point I want to make to what Professor Ashutosh Bhaskar said, under Lula, Brazil has become less unequal. In the last 20 years, India has become more unequal. That's the difference. Many are saying India today is comparable to Brazil of the 80s and the 90s. I mean, that's not exactly a great comparison to make. Secondly, uh, the point about say condition cash transfer scheme which is an important component of Lula's policy of reducing inequality it's work and people are saying why do we not do it in India that's interesting nobody's even suggesting that we should you know gag our media in the way say, China has or we should have uh, oligarchs the way Russia has but but surely we've uh, the point that I made earlier and the point I need to emphasize again Madam, I'm optimistic because I'm hopeful we learn the right lessons from the rest of the world. You know, we've replicated the worst practices. Maybe we'll move to a situation where we'll start replicating good practices. That's the reason for my optimism. The second reason for my optimism is that, you know, what we describe as anti-incumbency. That instead of becoming more venal and corrupt, our politicians would say there's a greater chance of I getting re-elected if I try and do something for my constituents. That's why I'm a little more optimistic. And, and, and of course, I won't talk about the population dividend. We've talked about that. So whereas there's a lot that's wrong, I think we're also seeing sections of the media being proactive, sections of civil society speaking out against corruption. We are seeing regime changes. We are seeing peaceful changes in government, all of which make me a little more optimistic. And I'm hopeful that my children and my grandchildren will live in a better India than my grandparents did that. Um, Oh, my, my parents did that. That's why I'm a little more. Thank you for enjoying. And Nitin, your last uh, comments, please. I think the whole idea of combining these arbitrary countries into something called BRICS is, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't mean anything. So uh, I don't understand what Russia is doing in this list. Because if you're looking at a list of countries which make a difference in the global balance of power, probably form the smallest set of new countries which need to be accommodated in, in patterns of global governance. It would be Brazil, uh, India, China, and two other countries would be Turkey and Indonesia. Right. These would be the countries which you need to analyze in terms of countries which are going to make a difference. I would include South Africa. Too. South Africa, yeah. South Africa. Uh, honorable. So these are the countries which are going to make a difference if you take the economy as well as the demographics. But look at Russian demographics. You will be happy if there's a Russia in 45 years' time. You know, it's it's that bad. So uh, uh, yeah, so th this list is arbitrary. I think it's say uh, it it it's caught on, but uh, we we shouldn't get too caught up with with this uh, acronym. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin. And as we're definitely over time now, we could have gone on. I know for several more hours, but or several more days. A whole uh, conference might be the next way to go. But I want to. Uh, invite you to join me in thanking our panelists for a very stimulating discussion. Thank you for coming and we hope this will be the first of many more such discussions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.